right, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Jakob Bosman, and I am the program coordinator for the Oxford Martin program on human rights for future generations. And um, I want to welcome you all today to this afternoon conference. We focus on long-term institutions and long-term governance. Um, before we move to the substance of the discussions, uh, first off, I want to thank the Oxford Martin School um, event staff for all their hard work uh, on organizing. So we were very grateful for all your support and help. Um, secondly, I want to um, draw your attention to the documents that are by the, uh, by the door there, which contain the conference program. It has the list of panels and the timings of the breaks involved. And then the second paper is our term card for this term. So we have uh, many events throughout the term that um, I want to draw your interest to, and especially um, I want to highlight our conference in November 24th, 25th, which focuses on post-2015 development agenda and the role of human rights in it. So it's a two-day conference with the lineup of great speakers, and I, I urge you all to go to our website and have a look at the full program and uh, come along, hopefully. Um, so, but today we focus on long-term governance, and uh, we have two panels lined up. The first one will be a more theoretically oriented panel and the second one will be more practice-oriented panel, but the two are supposed to, to have a dialogue um, with each other, and so hopefully we'll have a good kind of broad horizon of the, the questions about long-term governance, and uh, especially on the institutional perspectives. Um, we will, in each panel, we will have the, uh, the speakers first present their presentation, and then after this, this we'll, we'll open the floor for questions and, and comments, so, so, um, so that's the, the format of it. So each speaker will come here first and then uh, we will have all speakers line up here so you can ask questions from all of them. Um, but I want to all of you to join me now to welcome, uh, to give the opening address for the conference, uh, Professor Ian Golden, who is the director of the Oxford Martin School and the vice chair of the Oxford Martin's Commission. We're very glad to have you Ian here, thank you. Thanks very much, Yako. Welcome to you all. Uh, it's a huge pleasure to uh, be able to open this uh, workshop. For us uh, in the Oxford Martin School, thinking about how we address longer term challenges is absolutely central to our mandate and uh, is one of the most difficult and complex questions that we're grappling with. So any help that you can provide uh, this afternoon uh, will be more than welcome. We urgently need it, and the world urgently needs it. Uh, the Oxford Martin School was created to grapple with some of the toughest challenges of the 21st century in new ways. It was established uh, eight years ago by James Martin uh, because he felt that humanity is at the crossroads, that this will either be our best century because we can eradicate poverty, disease, and many other uh, great challenges that have faced humanity for millennia, or it could be our worst because we're unable to manage uh, the unintended consequences of, a, of our successes, climate change, pandemics, rising inequality, etc. Now, in thinking about how we grapple with this, we have at currently 32 research teams working across the Oxford Martin School, uh, working on many of these areas, and what they all have in common is a concern that although there's a great deal of knowledge about how to deal with global challenges and national challenges, the translation of knowledge is into action uh, is where the real problem lies. How does one get the politics, the decision making in business and in government, in institutions uh, to be aligned with one's scientific knowledge uh, or other knowledge of how to grapple with the problem. So this question of how can institutional mechanisms safeguard tomorrow, today, uh, is absolutely central to the resolution of this. And so I was delighted that we were able to support the creation of the Oxford Martin Program uh, on Human Rights for Future Generations. And Simon, Dominique, Iaco, and others that are in it are doing um, sterling work in addressing it. As part of this, we've also created the Oxford Martin Commission for Future Generations. And this was really 
our attempt to reach out to a group of very wise and experienced people to say, how would you solve this problem? How would you address these great challenges, knowing what you know after often having been in the leadership of an international organization, etc. One thing you'll see when you look at this report and their copies um, outside the door if you haven't seen it, and there's also, it's one year old this week, so this is also a birthday celebration for us. Um, you'll see a little short note on what we've done over the last year. Uh, you'll see in the commissioners who were chaired by Pascal Ami, the outgoing head of the World Trade Organization, included Jean-Claude Trichet, the former president of the European Central Bank, Michel Bachelet, Liu He, who's the most senior person responsible for planning in China and economic reform, London Elakani, and many others. What you'll see is a lot of um, impressive people who've achieved a lot and who have even greater ambitions, but they're not representative of future generations. So they're not young, uh, and also, unfortunately, they're not gender representative. But what I wanted to create with this was a group of people who would be able to push the envelope but be realistic. A group of people who were extremely ambitious to achieve change but wouldn't propose world peace and world parliament um, as a means of doing so. Uh, who've been there uh, and who have all the scars uh, on their back to show for it but who, um, who think there are new ways of doing things. So that's the group of commissioners, uh, a wonderful group and we met many times uh, over the period of about 18 months. And Anusha Devendra, who's here, is um, the impersonation of the engine behind this because she was there all the way through and is still here. So do engage with her um, if you want to know any further details about how it worked, uh, how we met, etc. So one, the first part of the report focuses on why do we need long-term thinking? What is it that short-term thinking cannot address? Uh, and um, this is really related to many of the biggest global and national challenges. Uh, and it's certainly not only about government, it's also about short-termism in business and the negative implications of that. Uh, so we were very keen to say uh, that clearly the short term is important. Interestingly enough, not all the commissioners were from democracies, uh, but um, Kishore Marabani from Singapore, Liu He from China, for example, were not. Uh, but there's a strong belief that short term and accountability is important, but that it is uh, only detrimental if seen in isolation of a longer term capacity to affect change and to drive change. So the first part of the report talks about the interlocking global challenges, and there's also in that an argument that these are getting worse, uh, and that the gap between the capacity to think long-term uh, and the need for it uh, is widening. So this is an, a, a, of growing significance for the future of the world, for the future of our societies, uh, because of globalization increasing complexity uh, and the spillover effects of, for example, seven billion people on the planet uh, all connected, eating more and consuming more as one, one dimension to this. The second part of the report focuses on lessons and what the commissioners felt was very important is to try and understand why sometimes in some societies uh, there is a capacity to deal with long-term challenges and other times there isn't. Sometimes some businesses do become long-term and other times that others don't. So what is it? What are the common features that institutions uh, that are able to grapple with long-term challenges have in common? Uh, and by working through a series of lessons of where issues have been dealt with, and some of the examples were, for example, the grappling with the ozone layer depletion, um, the fight against HIV AIDS, uh, smoking, uh, and the reduction in smoking, and various other uh, examples, that there has been success. And what do these have in common? And on the other side, how do we 
account for failure, many more failures, of course. It was much more difficult finding the successes uh, than the failures. Uh, but how do we account, uh, how, how do we account for, for failures? And that, what, what emerges from part two of the report is a number of common features of success. Uh, one is about a coalition of interests that see this capacity for longer-term thinking to be in their interests. And creating these coalitions, uh, we, we felt, becomes a very important uh, driving force. Leadership, clearly, uh, and the ability of people to argue for the long term, to explain to stakeholders why this is necessary is important. Tangible solutions, which although they might involve sacrifices in the short term, uh, are seen to be beneficial in the long term. And there are many examples of them, not least in the tax we pay for the military, uh, which is one of the strongest survivors always of long term. So looking at these different factors which account for these coalitions, which account for successes, and also trying to think about the failures is the f focus of the second part of the report. And then the third part of the report tries to map the challenges laid out in the first part with recommendations that arise from these lessons. And so the third part of the report is the lessons and recommendations and really emphasizes a number of different dimensions. One is how one would create coalitions and give some examples. So, for example, on climate change, we called as commissioners for a coalition of a few countries that are prepared to move and act, of cities that are prepared to act, and businesses that are prepared to act, what we call the C20, 30, 40. 20 countries, 30 groups of businesses, um, and 40 cities, which of course already exists as an alliance on climate change. And we're taking that forward uh, in a number of avenues. The basic argument, of course, is that something like a dozen countries account for over 85% of carbon emissions. So you don't actually need all actors. And in the US, even if the federal government uh, doesn't agree, something like six cities and six states account for well over 70% of carbon emissions. So why does one need all actors uh, to, uh, to move things forward? Of course, there are lots of reasons why one would want that, but as, uh, as a necessary first step. Another uh, recommendation on creative coalitions is regarding, for example, around what we call fit cities, non-communicable diseases, the need to reduce obesity, diabetes, uh, and cardiovascular and other diseases. We were lucky to have Peter Piot, uh, who's very much in the news at the moment because he uh, discovered Ebola in 1976, uh, but he was our commissioner that was focused on health, um, and he has pushed that, and we're moving that one forward. Um, there were recommendations regarding measurement. Um, we had a very strong group of commissioners, including um, Amartya Sen, Nick Stern, and others, who felt very strong that part of the problem is that we don't value the long term properly. So how does one bring into data, how does one bring into measures of GDP, economic activity, etc., indicators of long term sustainability, success, investment, depletion of capital, etc., through environmental destruction, etc. So measurement, valuation, indexing, etc., was another set of recommendations, and um, there's a series of recommendations regarding creating an index of preparedness for the long term, which we thought would also create some competitive pressures uh, regarding statistics and uh, how one measures GDP and other things. So very practical things, as well as a very important discussion on discount rates. For non-economists, that might sign, sound um, rather esoteric, but discount rates are the way that businesses, economists, governments measure uh, investment in the short, in the long term. And it really does make a very big difference what your discount rate is as to how far forward uh, you are planning, investing, uh, and looking. So that was a very strong thing. Interestingly, coming 
from uh, largely from Jean Claude Trichet. We also had uh, a strong set of recommendations around investing uh, in people and the future, and this is obviously about education. Uh, it's about jobs. It's about creating an environment in which people have an interest in the longer term and an, a knowledge amongst other things. And then there's a series of recommendations about institutions, ranging from one which was quite controversial, not least for Pascal Lamy and I, which was sunset clauses for global institutions. Um, so this idea of renewal or permanent renewal of institutions like the World Bank, uh, UN institutions and others, that their mission, their staffing, their budgets should be regularly reviewed and renewed. So the, the, the assumptions of permanency are not always the right ways to prepare for the long term uh, because you get uh, inability to grapple with evolving challenges. Um, there's a series of recommendations around creating agencies or institutions which are not party political but which are accountable. Um, so the idea of, for example, in the UK, the Office of Budget Responsibility or the FDA in the US, institutions like this which are agencies which are accountable um, things. There's also a question, of course, whether one counts, re thinks of second chambers as preparing one for the long term. Does the US Senate or the House of Lords make the US or the UK more able to deal with long term challenges? Some might question that, but no doubt you'll come back to, to some of these discussions. So there's a question about institutions. And then finally, there's a question about values. Um, can um, can societies that don't share the same values prepare themselves for the longer term uh, in a similar way if you don't value the future and the rights of future generations? And that's why this theme is so germane uh, to the discussion. So those are some of the, the issues we raised. I, uh, it's all on our website, and there's some of the background papers as well uh, and thinking available as well. What's happened a year on? Um, we were delighted by the take-up. Uh, we've had something like 1.2 million downloads of the report. You know, for, for academics, that's a big number. Um, for a newspaper blogger, that might not be. Uh, but for a report like this, we think that's a sign of interest. And it's also interesting that the downloads are from 171 different countries. So I think there's a real interest out there in people thinking about these issues. We've had numerous events. Pascal Lamy has been absolutely extraordinary in going around the world uh, to about 30 different countries, uh, talking about the report events, very widespread, and he continues to do so, and other commissioners are doing the same. We're taking forward um, first four of the recommendations. The first is the C203040 on climate where we've had meetings with the World Business Council on Sustainable Development, the UN Global Compact, and others with some countries, in like Connie Hildegard uh, representing the European um, Commission, uh, and the Cities Alliance and others, to try and think about how we build building blocks towards a climate change agreement on new alliances, which are complementary, they're not uh, necessarily dependent on the UN processes. We've had uh, meetings with Boris Johnson and others on this Fit Cities idea, and Boris, um, if he's still in, in, in power in the, in the town hall, uh, has agreed to chair a, uh, an initiative on Fit Cities. Um, we've had meetings with Angel Gurria, the head of the OECD, regarding an index of preparedness for the long term, uh, and the OECD is very interested in taking forward this idea of, an in of a new way, with a new capacity within the OECD of thinking about this, and Simon's going to have a call with um, the head of strategy from OECD on Friday about this. Um, and then we've had a series of meetings on WorldStat, which is about revising statistics and data and how we think about GDP, which Tony Atkinson uh, has very much, a professor here, has very much been in the lead on. Uh, that's really getting traction, and there's another call on Friday on that. Um, where the head of Eurostat and the head of various other statistical agencies are coming to them. We're likely to create a new non-government organization, uh, which will be sort of a, a guardian, a watchdog type of organization 
looking at statistical agencies and statistics and providing an independent thing. So those are four of the, of the early harvests from the um, commission that we think are sustainable. There will be hopefully others and it will continue to go forward. Just in closing, I would like to stress that this is not something we feel is ours, or we don't feel an ownership about it. It will be a success if other people take it and make meaning of it, uh, turn it into something which is useful for them, uh, and it helps the world and different groups, such as the many partners and others in the room today, take forward their agendas to um, advance this. So I can think of no more important question uh, to be grappling with. Uh, I can also think of no question that we need more help with. I don't, we, as the Oxford Martin School, but we as a community of thinkers worrying about this issue. So I wish you well, and uh, I hope that this is one step of many uh, in a path that gets resolution on these issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian, for this very thoughtful presentation. And so shall we just move directly then to panel one? So panel one's title is The Legitimacy and Effectiveness of Long-Term Institutional Mechanisms. And the first speaker of the panel is Professor Simon Caney from the University of Oxford, who is also the director of the Oxford Martin Program on Human Rights for Future Generations. And he will be speaking to us. Um, his title is Deepening Democracy, Free Proposals for Promoting Intergenerational Justice in Ways that Enhance Democracy. Well, very welcome, Simon. afternoon. So th thank you all very much for coming and, and Ian for, um, for giving that uh, welcome and introduction. As uh, Jaco mentioned, I'm one of the co-directors for the, uh, the program on human rights for future generations. And we all have about 15 minutes to talk. So uh, I thought I wouldn't go into very much detail on particular uh, proposals, but I would like to sort of emphasize four things that I think we need to think about and one of those four things is just to throw out some suggestions, but uh, the first thing I really wanted to emphasize was that um, there's a lot in the air about governing for the long term at the moment. There are academic books coming out about it. There's um, concern with climate change, with the 2008 financial crash, with pensions, with education. There are very many um, sort of issues of uh, concerning long-termism and myopia. And uh, there are also very different kinds of problems with different kinds of causes. So I guess the first thing I really wanted to emphasize, and I'm not gonna go through all of these, uh, is just to say that there are very many different kinds of driver that we're dealing with. So if our focus is, as mine is, on what kind of institutional mechanisms could there be for, for thinking about the long-term, um, I think the first thing we really need to do is to look at some of the, the causal factors. And this is very abstract, but I think if you look at it, you will realize that some of them, there's not much you can do to alter. Some of them you can channel and harness. So for example, um, existing incentive structures. So the first thing that might spring to mind is, well, look, think of it about uh, the electoral cycle. There's just nothing much you can do about that. But the political science literature shows that actually um, countries vary enormously in their provision for the long term, but they all face the electoral cycle. So how much they invest in pensions or in education or preserve of the natural world varies hugely. So even ones facing what you might think of as being common incentive structures, namely you have to win the next election, um, produce very different results, which means that some of these other factors play quite a significant role. And I think whatever solutions or proposals you have for responding to questions of short-termism, they're just not going to go anywhere unless we think about, well, why is this happening? 
and you take the 24-hour news cycle, it's very hard to see how you can get around that. It's very hard to see how you could insulate yourself from that. But um, ones like existing incentive structures, there's no reason why uh, we have to use um, treasury settlements of um, three-year spending cycles or three-year spending settlements. There's no reason why we have to have annual reviews. So um, when Ian was mentioning um, performance indicators, that's a, the sort of thing that we can, we can tweak and change and help kind of channel and guide behavior. Similarly, if you look at problems like ignorance and uncertainty, then you know, there seems some obvious kinds of response to that. One is that you just have to live with the uncertainty, but we have things like foresight programs to help deal with that. So I suppose what I'm trying to get at here is there's no one size fits all um, solution to problems of short termism because there is no one single problem. There are lots of different factors. The second thing I think we really need to uh, appreciate is that there's an enormous variety of different possible responses out there. I think I have 14 here. Again, I'm not, the point is not to go through them, it's, but in a way it's to say to us, look, we have quite a rich array of, of uh, techniques available to us. Um, and we can group them. So some of them are really about making the policy making process in legislatures more attuned to the long term. And um, Juliana will talk about, I think, youth participation, youth involvement. Um, we have a member of the Finnish Select Committee who will um, presumably talk about the Select Committee for the Future in Finland. Um, but there are other proposals out there. So, for example, Rupert Reid, um, a Green uh, councillor and academic, calls for there to be guardians for the future chosen by sortition um, with veto rights. Now, uh, I'm not a, uh, a fan of that particular proposal, but the point I just want to make here is we have lots of different um, techniques that we can use. And so the common response people have is there's nothing much we can do about it. It seems to me very misguided. Moving from the legislature to uh, government institutions, um, I'll say a bit more about mandate for the future, but uh, you know one explanatory account of why many institutions are very short-term is that they're very dependent on, um, for example, economic firms who have short-term interests. So some people propose, well, we should try and uh, weaken that dependence on such firms or such companies. Or we should redesign our audit culture. We should redesign the incentives that civil servants face. That's what I mean under governmental uh, kind of mechanisms. And then a third type of response is to create external bodies. And I think Ian maybe was saying something like this when talking about creating uh, an NGO or an international institution that assesses and collates data on statistics to assess performance. And we have kind of models of this in some form or other. Um, you know, Malta has a guardian for future generations. Um, the Welsh Future Generations Bill uh, includes a, a commissioner for future generations, and we have the commissioner for sustainable futures here. And of course, in Britain, we had the Sustainable Development Commission for 11 years. Or you might think of Germany's um, Council of Economic Experts, uh, which is not an intergenerational institution, but you could construe having an intergenerational council on the same grounds. Or you can create uh, independent institutions, like a, an independent central bank. And of course, one of the arguments for this is precisely to deal with short-termism. None of these mention the electorate, so you might have proposals that target the electorate. Um, I mean, one of the striking features of the debates about the Scottish referendum was uh, this intense political um, conversation about the future of the Union, the future of Scotland. Uh, maybe now is an appropriate time to have a constitutional conversation about uh, the future of the, the British Union. For example, next year is the 800th uh, anniversary of the Magna Carta. So you might think, well, this is a really appropriate time to think about um, the institutions, the rights, the principles that we affirmed, and whether they need to be you know, rethought for the future. So why not have deliberation days? That is, why not have 
days where um, there's no work, you uh, either go to a local uh, school or the business that employs you or some other local institution, um, and the whole focus of the day is thinking about Britain, the world in the future. Uh, in Wales, there was a, a sort of national conversation about the Wales we want. And the reason I emphasize this is otherwise it's going to be a kind of an elite-driven uh, phenomenon where there's no engagement uh, with the electorate. And then, of course, you know, legal uh, experts will say, well, you can use courts and constitutions. And uh, there's active, for example, public trust litigation in America designed to protect future generations from climate change, but using the courts as a technique. So I just wanted to bring out here, really, that um, we're going to have representatives of different of those proposals at different points. But uh, without this claiming to be exhaustive, there are a lot of things we can uh, adjust and revise. Third theme. Well, you know, I, my training is as a political philosopher, and uh, I think, well, what are the criteria we're using? And here are the three that strike me as the most sensible. Um, the reason I emphasize the drivers so much is well, we need something that works. We need something that's effective. And the second thing is we need something that is accessible from here. So, uh, you know, no claims, let's have a democratic world state and um, the lion shall lie down with the lamb and so on. Something that we can get through from here. And one striking thing is many of these institutional uh, reforms have proved to be quite short term um, and short lived. So uh, thinking of Israel, the Hungarian one um, was considerably watered down in 2011 to 12. And the UK Sustainable Development Commission only lasted 11 years. So those are the criteria. And then the third one, which I think some people overlook, is you have to have proposals that are not just effective and feasible, but don't compromise other standards. So that's why I have misgivings about an unelected guardian with a, a veto right over legislation. That, that seems undemocratic to me. I mean, you might think there's a gray area here. And, and um, for example, a, uh, an independent central bank, you might think of as a, a departure from democratic principles that's justified. So you might not want to make it black and white, but have gradations. But the point is that we can't ignore um, other moral criteria. OK, so now I'm going to be a bit more speculative. And what I and others have been working on is some of these uh, proposals in much more detail. And um, two of them have some relationship with the Finnish Select Committee. So I'd be very interested to know whether what looks, in theory, good in practice works out at all. So imagine this. Imagine that uh, a newly elected government is required to give a, a kind of a State of the Union speech that is Britain in 50 years' time, or Britain in 100 years' time. So a report for the future. And imagine that the opposition is required to respond to this and give their vision for the future. Uh, and imagine that it's a public debate where um, representatives from NGOs and civil society are present. Imagine also that it's combined with discussions at local level and at business level and at school. What I'm trying to get articulate here is uh, what, calling, following John Rawls, you'd call an idea of public justification. Um, and the, the aim here is to tackle some of the drivers. So some of the drivers of short-termism are just that we don't think about these issues, that they're too gradual, they're too creeping, um, out of sight, out of mind, and that we procrastinate. Whereas if it's built into the uh, government business that it and the civil servants working for it must have a vision for the future, which is then having to be justified in public um, with hard questions from those who disagree, then I think it, it offers no guarantees, but it makes it much harder for people to ignore long-term trends. It kind of harnesses a self-interest because you do not want to look silly. You do not want to look ill thought out. Why not have a select committee for the future? Uh, as I said, we'll hear much more about the Finnish system. But um, I think one virtue of this kind of approach, which was put forward in the House of Commons Public Administration Select Committee, is again, it kind of puts the future at the heart of the present. Um, it makes it very hard to ignore long-term policies because uh, it's going to be scrutinized with people whose role it is to think about the long-term trends. 
So if a, such a committee could advise, scrutinize, or maybe even initiate legislation, then I think it, it's a way of giving the, the future kind of a voice in the present. And the striking thing about this is that it enhances democratic government. It doesn't compromise it. Okay, I'm just throwing out uh, kind of suggestions, but ones that I think merit much more detailed analysis. And then the third thing picks up on something that uh, Ian mentioned and is, is very much flagged up in the report, which is uh, audit systems and performance indicators. Often these are for very, you know, no good reason, are heavily focused on the short term. Um, so people do use league tables, people do use performance indicators, and with the sustainable development goals at the, at the global level, there'll be even more emphasis on indicators. So I think it would be a missed opportunity not to find a way of embodying intergenerational concerns into performance indicators. And I've quoted the, uh, the report at length there to illustrate some of the, the things that might be done. And I, I mean, this is available later, should anyone want any copy of this? But I wanted to sort of relate this to some work done in uh, climate change, where uh, Robert Sokolow at, at Princeton, Stephen Davis at California, talk about commitment accounting, because I think this is the kind of thing we could use to have a long-term performance indicator. And the idea of uh, commitment accounting is that you, you don't at T1 measure how many greenhouse gas emissions China emitted at that moment, or the UK, or a given company. Rather, you look at the actions that it performs then in terms of how much uh, emissions of greenhouse gases does it commit that unit to in the future. Well, commit doesn't mean you know, necessarily will absolutely guarantee, but is projected to result from that. So in other words, you, you evaluate at T1 the, the likely impacts that an action will have uh, in the future. So for example, you know, when a, a coal fire power station is built on their commitment accounting, you um, assess that country or uh, that unit at that time according to the committed emissions. So you could do this for designing urban infrastructure and you know, look at whether urban planning increases or decreases transportation, uh, runways, airports. One thing I really want to stress with this is that it would be wrong to have an account that was sort of indifferent to people's capabilities and opportunities. So using the language that occurs at international environmental law, I think you'd need a metric that was um, common but differentiated. So it would make allowance for countries which are, are poorer, which have less access to renewables and clean technology. And the other point is you can generalize. You can take this further than just greenhouse gases. Um, you could look at how, many, uh, how much money is being invested in education and schools especially primary education, how much money is being spent on clean technology. And to use a metaphor that is in the, the, uh, the report, but I find it also in lots of people working on accountancy, the point is you don't measure current performance. Um, so for a patient, uh, you don't look at how they feel now. You look at their, uh, their blood pressure or uh, their cholesterol level because you're projecting for the future. So it seems to me this is a really important initiative and that it tackles lots of the drivers like ignorant, um, it's harder to ignore creeping problems because you include those in your analysis. Um, it makes very visible and concrete the impacts of your actions in the future. And it means there's genuine accountability. And I'll just by, uh, conclude by adding one other thing on, um, on what I call auditing, which is it's not just about the indicators, but the time scale you, you use for assessing compliance. And this very long passage is from um, Anthony King and Iva Crew, who say, well, look, it's ridiculous that uh, government departments are using you know, one-year uh, cycles for uh, assessing performance, or even three-year ones. You know, that's designed to produce short-termism. So when assessing compliance with long-term performance indicators, I think it's also worth not just having a snapshot, but taking it over an extended period. So anyway, I'm just throwing out those three thoughts. I think they score well on effectiveness because they are targeting certain drivers. 
They're upstream, unlike some of the legal constitutional ones. They target the decision-making process. They're not radical you know, um, departures from existing institutions. Um, and they don't compromise any sort of democratic values or substantive values. You're not giving veto rights to unelected bodies. So I'd like to put that forward to the conversation as things that we should take forward. So I'll wrap up now, but um, that's just a summary. I think the crucial things are we have a diversity of drivers and any kind of institutional response has to respond to that diversity. We have a diverse set of institutional responses. There's a common normative framework and then here's three elements of uh, food for thought. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Simon. Uh, so our next speaker, then we hear from the younger generation as well, as we're talking about long term, we want to give voice to all generations. So um, we're very happy to welcome Ms. Juliana Vida de Nul from EUI Florence, and she will be talking about uh, youth in politics, a demand of intergenerational justice. Welcome. for the, uh, the invitation. I'm not as young as I look. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so the, the, uh, my name is Giuliana Vidadanure. I'm a postdoctoral fellow in Florence at the European University Institute. And the topic of my presentation today will be Youth in Politics, a Demand of Intergenerational Justice. Um, so basically I'm going to do the opposite of what Simon did, so it's good that we have a bit of variety. I'm going to focus on one specific proposal, uh, but my background is also in political philosophy. So I'm going to assess sort of um, the normative adequacy of, the, of this proposal. Um, just to give you a bit of background, my, um, I just finished my PhD thesis, and the title was Treating Young People as Equals, Intergenerational Justice in Theory and Practice. And uh, it was um, a normative discussion of how the value of equality applies through time. So if we uh, are concerned with uh, inequalities between generations, um, which inequalities should we think that matter? Should we think that inequalities between birth goals or age groups matter? In which way? So what, is mean, what does it mean, for example, for a young person to be equal to an, uh, an elderly? So these are the kinds of questions I, I, I worked on. And it concerns the long term, given that one of the requirements of uh, age group justice is to, or at least towards young people, is to prevent the clustering of disadvantage uh, over, a life, over a life course. So. Um, uh, youth unemployment and youth disadvantage, youth poverty are associated with a, a number of long-term scarring effects over the lifespan. So um, I, I discussed um, the prevention of these risks over the life course. But today what I want to focus on is uh, the topic of youth in politics. So um, what I will discuss is the introduction of youth quotas in parliament. And I can now see that I can't fine, I can do without it. So the question that I want to ask today is, should we think that um, having more young people in Parliament or introducing youth quotas in Parliament uh, can increase our chances of meeting the demands of intergenerational justice? Um, and that's not really um, such an easy question. I'm going to try to show you why. But an important distinction that uh, needs to be made here is the distinction between current young people and distant future generations. So um, what I was primarily interested in my thesis was young people over their life course. But what we are interested here um, about today is also the very long term. So we are interested in how to represent the interest of future generations adequately. So it's not just uh, current young people or current children, it's also unborn future generations. And so the, the, my uh, presentation today will be structured along these two axes. So I'll first ask whether 
introducing youth quotas in Parliament can help uh, increase the, uh, our chances of meeting the requirements of justice between overlapping generations, or in other words, can youth quotas benefit current young people? Uh, and then I will briefly look at whether youth quotas um, can help us increase uh, our sort of the, our chances of meeting the requirement of justice between non-overlapping generations, so not generations that do not coexist, or can youth quotas benefit future generations? Right, so the problem uh, from which I'm starting from is the absence of young people in parliament or the underrepresentation of, of young people in parliament. And what I want to find out is whether this is a problem for justice between generations. And it's not really clear that it is a problem because if you adopt a diachronic view or um, a view that focuses on complete lives, you may say uh, that uh, the underrepresentation of young people in parliament or the absence of young people under the age of 30 in parliament, for example, is not so much a problem uh, because young people will get to be represented equally uh, over their complete lives. So what's the difference, for example, between the absence of young people in parliament and the absence of uh, women or ethnic minorities in parliament? It is that um, young people only are not represented at one stage of their life, but over their life course, they will have been represented equally. And uh, the other reason why it's not obvious that there is a prima facie problem of justice with this is that um, if there are no women in parliament or if there are no uh, ethnic minorities in parliament, you may think that they are not there because they have been discriminated through the procedure to access uh, parliament. In the case of young people, we may think that they are being discriminated based on a morally relevant criteria, which is experience. So we may think, you know, of course there are no young people of let's say 19, 20, 21 in parliament, but um, young people need training, they need to get experience. So this um, absence from parliament is actually, uh, can be thought as legitimate. But what I want to suggest here is that uh, there may be instrumental reasons why we may think that uh, it, is a, it is a very big problem if there are no young people in parliament, no young people present under deliberation, or not sufficiently so. And here I'm drawing on Anne Phillips, and I want to say that there are two main reasons why, uh, two main instrumental reasons why we may, we may want more young people in parliament, still on grounds of justice between overlapping generations. Uh, some are substantive, they have to do with the substantive representation uh, of youth interests in parliament, and the other is symbolic. First, talk about substantive representation. So, um, we may think that um, having more young people in parliament could help in prevent the exclusion of youth concerns from the party packaging of ideas. So, I borrowed this language from uh, Anne Phillips. Um, and for reasons that are easy to understand, young people in the UK, for example, uh, often uh, list unemployment as one of their primary concerns. Uh, and they do so significantly more than any other age groups. Um, and there are studies that show that uh, young people, uh, at least I think it was a study uh, for the, I don't have my notes now, but uh, 18 years old, um, say only 7% of 18 years old in the UK think that uh, parliamentarians um, are concerned by the same things that they are concerned by. So we could think that having more young people in parliament could contribute in preventing the exclusion of youth concerns from the party uh, packaging of ideas, but also we can consider that it may contribute in challenging the misrepresentations of young people in parliament. So um, if young people are represented as um, self-serving or feckless, uh, this will have an impact on the representation of, those, of their interests. And I just want here to quote So the Intergenerational Foundation, they recently published a report on the perception of young people in European countries, so they commissioned a report. Uh, it said that British people in their 20s achieve the lowest scores of any country in relation to being viewed with respect. And in terms of content, British people in their 20s came first. And uh, so because of these misrepresentations, um, Furlong and, and Car uh, Cartmel, for example, argues that when issues emerge that have a core relevance for young people, they are often tackled from a paternalistic and condescending, we know what's best for you perspective. And of course, an example they put forward is unemployment. Politicians tend to focus not so much on creating opportunities, but on motivating young people who are presented as feckless and even as inadequate citizens. 
So we can we can think that the news quotas can have the modest uh, impact of uh, contributing to challenging this misrepresentation, uh, then underlying the, the concerns and the important challenges that are at stake for young people in our current world. There are also some symbolic reasons to uh, want to introduce news quotas in Parliament. So we may think that given the um, some have called it uh, intergenerational democratic deficit. So given the fact that young people, um, their voting turnouts are extremely low and compar in comparison with other age groups, um, it's very important to attest the political equality of young people. So youth quotas could play this role. So saying that we always want at least 30 MPs, let's say, um, below the age of 30 years old, could play an important role in reintegrating young people in um, or at least restoring them in the status as equal uh, citizens. And then, of course, there may be some symbolic effects associated with this attestation of uh, political equality, uh, which um, has to do possibly with the re-inclusion of uh, young people in political communities and, and with, um, sorry, and it, so it could pos potentially have an impact in voting turnout and it could also have an impact on the ensemble of other measures that will have to be put in place in order for youth quotas to work. So increased uh, civic education in schools, for example, uh, would be something that would be raised. So when it comes to overlapping generations, I think that the substantive representation angle and the sim symbolic representation angle provide a good basis for politics of youth presence in parliament. But here again, we are talking about the relatively long term, but we are talking about the lifespan of young people. Right, their substantive interests are fundamentally diachronic because any decisions taken now for young people will have uh, extremely important long-term positive or negative consequences of their on their life course. But now what I want to talk about very briefly is whether we can think that having more young people in parliament can also help us meet the demands of justice towards future generations. Um, and so there is this sort of quite intuitive idea that uh, we find even in Israel in as early as 1845, that the youth of a nation are the trustees of posterity. So there is this idea that young people can represent future generations or are better uh, placed to represent the interests of future generations than uh, older age groups. And I want to um, point to three reasons why we may think that there is something quite intuitive about this. Uh, and it, uh, it would be really worth looking into it even more. So first, it's the higher stake argument. It says that young people will experience a higher share of the long-term consequences of joint failure. So you may think that uh, young people's interests are further aligned with the interests of future generations uh, than the interests of older age groups. So that may give us a, a reason to think that having young people in parliament not only is important on grounds of justice between overlapping generations, but it can also help in meeting the demands of justice towards future generations as well, just because their interests are more aligned with the interests of future generations. <coughs> Another argument that can be provided, a uh, higher indirect stake argument, is to say that young people also have an indirect stake in their children's future. So this is, this is more indirect. It's not just that they have an interest in the future themselves, given that there will be um, they will have to experience uh, the negative consequences of, of joint failure in 50 years, say, but they also see the, the burden of, this, uh, of these costs on their own children's future. So that may be another reason. And a third reason, uh, which I call holistic expertise argument, is the view that not, not really, it's not really that young people or young MPs themselves will be better able to represent the interests of future generations, it is that intergenerational parliaments will be more able to represent the interests of future generations because they will be more innovative, more competent. So here we can look at the literature on intergenerational practices and how intergenerational practices can foster uh, innovation, uh, original decision making. And this is not only because, um, because there are some age and cohort related or specific interests or concerns, but it's also because different age groups, different cohorts, have had different training, different educational training, so they bring in a, 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 bro a broad variety of perspectives. So this is another kind of indirect argument for why we may think that having more uh, young people in parliaments could help um, in meeting some of the very long-term challenges that we have to meet. Of course, there are limitations uh, with these um, with these arguments. Um, 
one of the limitations of the higher stake argument um, is that, in fact, when you look at the when you look at the data on this, even though young people have a higher have a higher stake or will um, be emboldened by a higher uh, share of the costs, uh, it's not really the case that uh, young people discount the future any less than other age groups. So. And if we want to be essentialistic about young people and say, well, they will be better at representing the interests of uh, future generations, then this is a problem for the argument, of course. Uh, as far as the indirect stake argument is concerned, uh, so it's, it's, it's there are also many problems with this view. Um, there is no actual evidence that young people care about the future more. Uh, I mean, there is there's plenty of, uh, of um, for example, evidence that uh, sometimes the elderly um, recycle more or you know, there are plenty of, of um, very mixed evidence on this, um, that uh, uh, young children and young people do not value nature as previous cohorts did, things like that. I think the holistic expertise argument is interesting because it doesn't, uh, it doesn't uh, have the same, the same problems and it really focuses on intergenerational cooperation um, rather than on the essentialistic features of each age group. But, um, just a few final remarks about this. Um, so I think that we can still take the idea that young people have a higher uh, stake of, uh, uh, in, future, in the future and in long-term consequences of current failures. And this is not only a, a, a strong idea, but it is, a, it is an actual idea. And so I think that uh, this is a good basis, again, to make the case for youth quotas a bit more long-term. Um, but the, And there is also this holistic expertise argument, which says that we need cooperation. And I want to say that the burden of proof often um, lies on those who are currently overrepresented um, to show that this is not a problem for long-termism. So I think we can do our best to provide reasons why having more young people in parliament will have a positive impact. But we can also think that the overrepresentation, well, the underrepresentation of young people is a problem and that we should see whether there is no, what the burden of proof is on those who oppose this reform, for example, to show that um, there is it's not a problem at all for the long-term decisions that we have to take, that there are no young people involved in deliberations. And of course, I've only talked about youth quotas because I have very little time and I'm almost done now. But um, youth in politics um, can take other forms. Uh, we were talking earlier about uh, giving the right to vote to teenagers. Um, so these, these are in the same framework, I think, of analysis. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Juliana. And so our next speaker is Professor Jörg Tremel from the University of Tübinger. Uh, he will be speaking about parliaments and future generations, the four powers model. Thank you. This videotape will remind me of smiling from time to time. Um, yeah, I hold the first uh, German professorship for intergenerational just policies, and um, I'm also a founder or co founder of the Foundation for the Rights of uh, Future Generations. <coughs> I pre presented this, uh, I presented at the workshop of um, the Hungarian ombudsman uh, earlier this year, Marcel Szabo. And those who were in Budapest will recognize the first two or three slides, but uh, will be quite surprised um, when I come to the second part of my presentation because I changed my views on some key points um, since then. Well, <coughs> to start with, it's only since 20th century that the pace of humankind and the environment have started to fall apart. In environmental issues, more than elsewhere, the effects of current actions reach far into the future and can have a deeply negative impact on the quality of life of many future generations. It is now not very controversial anymore in philosophy that our previous neighbor ethics mm, is, is of limited use uh, for this new era. Um, but it is more controversial though whether or not the new era also requires a new model of democracy, a new model of government. 
as we've heard already from Sam Candy, um, it is only recently that the field of political science has put a stronger emphasis on the identification and analysis of presentism as a challenge in its own right. Um, and both voters and those they elect typically pursue short-term interests. And don't forget the voters. Uh, some studies uh, come to the conclusion that the main problem is um, the elected. Um, but I don't want to mm, join this critique of elected politicians. Uh, we often forget to put our attention first to the presentism of the, of the electorate, of the voters. Faced with a choice between receiving a certain state benefit or tax concession, either now or later, um, say in one year, most people opt for the present day. That's quite common. So this has some, some bearing on, on uh, the uh, behavior of politicians in a democracy. Opposition politicians take an interest in being elected, as do governing politicians in their being re-elected. So it's not to say that as a group, politicians are exclusively motivated by power, uh, position or privileges. Even those who seek to shape sensible policy have to exert power for doing so. And the only way to obtain that kind of power is for holding an office or mandate. Mm. So during campaigns, everybody who is uh, part of the political game um, has the focus to maximize votes. And um, political competitions between two politicians one of whom promises some benefits to occur in the near future, while the other one pledges the same, but in the further future, usually don't end in favor of the latter, uh, as, as least as long as the electorate is, is presented. The absence of representation of future generations means that conflicts of interest are decided by the majority of eligible voters and not the majority of those affected by decisions. Future people that are relevantly affected don't have any influence over such decisions. And this representation gap is fundamentally different from deficiencies in the participation shares of other interest groups, e.g. women, elderly, or foreigners. These groups are usually present here and now. They can take part in the political discourse. They can write opinion editorials, appear on talk shows, and in many cases, except children, participate in elections. If future citizens could assert their interest in the political decision-making process, majority outcomes in important political decisions, energy policy, also financial policy, pension policy, uh, would be different. I want to um, mention a caveat here already. Mm, subsequent to the failed climate change conferences, some experts have been asked whether democracy is the right form of government to overcome ecological challenges. The international climate change conferences are in fact a bad example to use because it was not only the democratic but also the non-democratic states which took part in the failed talks. Moreover, comparative studies have demonstrated that the ecological performance of authoritarian regimes is far worse than that of democracies. I think we can pay credit to Churchill's famous saying here. Mm. The increasing acceptance of our responsibility for posterity has resulted in, fact in the fact that constitutions often refer to generations to come now. We have some constitutions who explicitly grant rights to future generations. And then we have um, a number of other constitutions who don't speak of the rights of future generations, but rather of uh, um, the mandate of the state to safeguard their interests. Other constitutions speak of interests or needs of future generations. Mm, if you really mention all these clauses now in Hungarian, um, German, French, and all the other constitutions would actually eat up all my time. So I go pretty quickly through this and ask what is the impact? The impact of all these constitutional clauses in favor of posterity is quite low. We have to give a quite sobering answer that neither countries who adopted ecological clauses felt obliged to phase out nuclear energy as a consequence, nor did they take serious action against climate change. So constitutional courts in general seem to be a poor watchdogs over the rights of future generations. 
In practice, these constitutional clauses did not make much difference. So what I say is what is required is not less than an extension of a centuries-old separation of powers between the legislative, executive, and judicial branch of government. The Trias Politica principle is no longer appropriate in this new area in the Anthropocene. In order to make the political system future-oriented, a new fourth branch, which ensures that the interests of future generations are taken into account in today's decision-making process, is needed. Now, there could be the counter-argument that this kind of representation is at odds with the principle of democracy. For Rousseau, the principle of representation was at odds with the rule of the people. But we today distinguish two forms, two legitimate forms of democracy, direct, as in Switzerland, or representative, like in most other countries. And there's a widespread consensus today that the principle of representation of the present demos is not antagonistic to the idea of democracy. So the mere extension to future people um, is, at least at first sight, just another form of representation, and as a consequence, not at odds with the democratic principle. But the devil lies in the details, of course. Um, should this new institution to represent future generations be entitled to propose legislation, to put a suspensive veto on it, or even to quash it for good? Should such a body be connected to the legislator in order to formulate sustainable laws, or, either, or rather to, um, to the judiciary with a reactive role to, um, to stop laws? Mm. And then how many members should the fourth branch, which I propose, have, and which resources, how long should the terms of office be for members? Who determines the salaries? And uh, could members be forced to resign if they are guilty of misconduct? So all these, not philosophical, but rather political questions come into play at some point in time. Who could convene it and how often? Mm. And should it be one model for all countries, one model fits all, or should it be different for each country? Independent of the formal and legal design, is there anything else about its general framework which could benefit or hinder its success? Before I answer these questions in a very preliminary way, um, I just want to um, make a little detour and look at the history of the separation of power model. And then we come, of course, to John Locke and um, then to Montesquieu, who was the first who recognized the three branches. And what we can learn from this history of political thought is that the presence is just a stage between past and future. So our present political system with the three-branch model is not set in stone. It is a successor of a two-branch system and it might be the predecessor of a four-branch model. So the common um, knowledge, there is no alternative, is just nonsense. Mm, well, we, we can look at other countries to, to their lessons to learn um, for this endeavor. And one conceptual tool to uh, to look for different case studies all over the world is this uh, Kugoid. It represents a uh, yeah, potentially pretty high number of case studies. We can first look at institutions who represent future generations, and then we can look to other, um, well, institutions to represent and other institutions to consider future generations, like um, advers advisory councils or ethical codes for members of parliament or uh, constitutional clauses. I think this is a, a big watershed um, from the very beginning. Then when we look at the left side, um, we will find institutions that cover all policy fields and then those who deal with environmental policy only, financial policy or specific other policy fields. And those can be on a national level, on a supranational like the EU, an international or regional level. Throughout the globe, there's now 
a considerable number of organizations with a mandate for sustainability and intergenerational justice. However, most of these enjoy a merely consultative status and thus exercise little actual power in a laboring sense. A decisive touchstone is whether or not such institutions have the right to intervene in legislative procedures. Um, among the eight institutions mentioned in the UN report on um, intergenerational solidarity, only four exhibit these competences. We had, I mean, this, uh, this report uh, proposed the High Commissioner for Future Generations on uh, UN level, but he mentioned eight institutions mm, which were said to be the most powerful so far. And among them were the Finnish Committee of the Future, which has, like the German Parliamentary Advisory Council on Sustainable Development, um, the capacity to propose laws, but not as a body, but only the individual members, because they are members of the parliament as well. So actually we don't have any body who can initiative, initiate uh, legislation. Then we had, yeah, we must uh, use the past tense here, the Commission for Future Generations in Israel and the Future Generations Ombudsman in Hungary, who were able to challenge laws, I'll go into this a little bit uh, later. And then we had uh, the other institutions who were not able to propose laws and not able to challenge laws. The two most ambitious and, and bold um, attempts to institutionalize uh, the rights of future generations were the commissions for future generations in Israel, which existed from 2001 mm -hmm. until 2006 or 2007, and then it was disbanded by the Knesset and the parliament. And uh, also the Hungarian ombudsman had a very far-reaching mandate until 2011, before it was disempowered substantially. And that was for reasons, it was not out of the blue. Um, I mean, uh, there are many versions of these uh, stories. Um, and one, one story is uh, that they were just stepping on the toes of short-term interests, and that was the reason why they were disempowered or disbanded. But another story is that they weren't able to cope with the uncertainty or ignorance of what actually serves future generations best. And this is, apart from the non-identity problem and uh, the thesis of the rich future, which I consider to be solved in philosophical uh, literature, the biggest problem, the, the uncertainty um, of the effects of our present day actions on the future, the uncertainty um, of future generations' interests or preferences, not actually needs, but preferences, the uncertainty of future technological developments, and in a very mm, controversial decision, the, the Hungarian ombudsman used all his powers to um, stop or prevent a huge biomass facility in the buffer zone of a, of a wine region and a world cultural, cultural heritage region in Hungary, in Tokai. Now, I think this is a very difficult decision. I mean, biomass in general uh, has an ecological um, aspect. So, biomass of rural conservation, which one serves posterity more? I think if the parliament says, we opt for biomass, it is very difficult for an ombudsman to make to, to stop such a law without being charged of, of eco-dictatorship or future dictatorship. And likewise, the Israeli commissioner once exhausted his far-reaching competences, competences in the case in which the perspective on intergenerational justice also could be claimed by both sides. Simply put, he advocated a law for the inclusion of handicapped young people, which the finance minister of Israel had reje rejected for cost reasons, for financial sustainability, as he has put it. So the, um, the sword of the um, Israeli commissioner, kind of a filibuster, um, was used to, to stop a, well, a democratically passed laws. And um, I think we should 
learn some lessons from these e practice-oriented uh, examples. Um, and I want to make a proposal now for a future branch in Germany. I think the idea of the Trias Politica varies from country to country, certainly from, from Great Britain or from the UK to, to Germany or France. Um, for instance, the French Constitutional Court, the judiciary has much less power than, than in Germany. And in, in uh, the UK, you don't have, you don't have even a, a written constitution, so it's a completely different system as well. So what I say now is really for Germany, and you can make up your mind if it's uh, of any use for other countries. Mm, the key criteria, I think, should be a proactive role, a constructive role, instead of a destructive role. So I would say every institution to represent future generations should have the right to propose legislation, to initiate it, and not to suspend laws or to stop laws temporarily or permanently. This goes against the idea of an ombudsman for future generations as long as he has such a mandate. Proceeding from the existing infrastructure of advisory boards and councils of experts as a reservoir for possible new arrangements is also very important. In Germany, with the Council for Sustainable Development, the German Advisory Council on the Environment, and the German Advisory Council on Global Change, it's not chance, change, three councils appointed by the federal government exist already. And then there's a, another one which consists of parliamentarians. Um, the remits of these councils partly overlap. And they are basically powerless. They cannot mm, enforce their will uh, on, on, on any other um, branch. So they are not part of a, a separation of, of power um, so far. It seems sensible to merge them all into one central ecological council. Likewise, there are several independent councils on financial policy, best known as the German Council of Economic Experts, which was already mentioned, and um, there are several other ones. And I would propose to merge them all into a new body, the Financial Council. And now the key innovation for the political system would be to endow both new councils with a right to initiative, allowing them from outside to introduce legislation into the German parliament. In order to do this, the rules of procedure would have to be revised. Currently, um, the procedure, the uh, Geschäftsordnung states that bills have to be signed either by a fraction or by 5% of all members of um, the MPs. Mm, but um, in my proposal, those motions from outside would just be treated as if they were brought in by 5% of the members of the Bundestag. Now, this seems not a very ambitious proposal. Yeah, I come to the last slide. But I would say in the long run, with support of the media, it could change the political landscape um, substantially, and it would provide a fourth or maybe third and a half branch of government without being charged of eco dictatorship and um, using the existing um, bodies, so it would be path dependent and has maybe little more chances of realization than, has more chance of realization than some other propo proposals. So my upshot is what philosophy, <coughs> um, when in philosophy, neighbor ethics should be replaced by ethics for the Anthropocene, democracy with three branches should be replaced by democracy with four branches. Thank you very much. Um, so our final speaker in the first panel has come all the way from another side of the world. Uh, we're very happy to welcome Dr. Peter Lawrence from the University of Tasmania, who will be speaking about transgenerational demos, climate treaty making reform and procedural justice. Thank you, Peter.
thank uh, thank you, uh, Yoko, and f and can we get rid of this? What do I press? Save. Okay, start again. Thank you, Yoko, and, and thank you very much for the organisers for the opportunity to participate uh, in this interesting uh, conference today. Um, there is a 10 hour time difference with Tasmania, so if I start dozing off during my presentation, please uh, throw something. <laughs> um, the, I should just mention briefly my background. Uh, my background is in international law. Um, I worked as a career diplomat for 14 years and eight years of that was involved negotiating global environment treaties. Uh, which is perhaps something I shouldn't mention given the current Australian government's approach to the climate change <laughs> ne negotiations. Um, as the title of my uh, uh, talk indicates, though, I've become increasingly interested in uh, normative um, issues. Uh, now, as implicit in uh, uh, what Jörg was saying, uh, we can't have a democracy without uh, a demos, people. And this poses a couple of acute challenges when we think of future generations. Firstly, can we extend a demos into the future? Does that make sense? And secondly, if we're thinking about institutional proposals at the global level, is there anything that resembles a global demos, given the rather fractured state of the international, international society. Um, so addressing these two challenges will be at the heart of um, what I have to say today. Uh, now I want to, um, what I wanted to do today is explore um, uh, and propose some democratic legitimacy criteria that would be appropriate for evaluating institutional uh, reform uh, uh, proposals that give weight to the interests of uh, future generations. Now, the um, I will be saying uh, I probably won't have time to talk much about the causes of short-termism, um, but I agree very much with Simon's comments that one does have to bear strongly in mind uh, the causes to ensure that institutional proposals uh, hit the mark. Um, Later in my, my, my paper, uh, I'll talk a little bit about how these criteria pan out in relation to a proposed uh, UN um, High Commissioner for Future Generations. Uh, my starting point is a model of democratic uh, legitimacy, which involves uh, uh, extracting some common threads, if you like, from uh, uh, various theories of democratic legitimacy. And here I've relied very much on the, the synthesis um, uh, undertaken by Sylvia Carlson, Vincusen and Anto Dima, and also Peter Van Hahn. Now, very briefly, these criteria uh, involve the notion of fair representation, accountability and transparency, fair and effective outcomes. So we've got an effectiveness uh, criteria linked to substantive justice, not just procedural justice. And finally, deliberation or participation. I now want to say a bit more about each of these criteria. Now, fair representation. Now, if we think about uh, uh, future, uh, genera future generations and what it can mean for them to be represented if we adopt um, an agency notion of representation, there is immediately a, a problem because future unborn persons cannot uh, delegate uh, to, to current ge generations. However, uh, Hannah Pitkin's, uh, Pitkin's notion of representation entailing substantive acting uh, for others' interests um, uh, if we use that notion of representation, there's not a problem here. And uh, a number of philosophers have suggested that um, if we use this model, it, there's nothing incoherent about the idea of having a proxy that uh, represents the, uh, the interests of future un unborn p 
persons. Now, when this is idea is proposed, often the example given is uh, a guardianship arrangement, for instance, where you have a guardian appointed uh, by the state that represents, for, for example, the interests of a severely disabled uh, child. Uh, it's important to remember a couple of limitations here. One is that the proxy idea and guardianship doesn't happen in a vacuum. So guardianship involves uh, a mandate, a set of duties and limitations that surround the, the, the guardianship relationship. It's also important to remember that guardianship is usually limited to meet the meeting of basic needs. So it's not a perfect analogy in terms of a proxy if that proxy is meant to represent more broadly input into the political uh, uh, process. Um, if we go with the proxy idea, then what about, uh, how does this um, uh, relate to uh, legitimacy of the, the proxy in terms of their relationship to, to uh, unborn uh, persons? Um, in this context, I've found very useful uh, Michael Soward's work on non-electoral claims. And the basic argument he puts is that um, electoral uh, representation is often seen as the gold standard for democracy, if you like. And he and others have pointed out that uh, there's now a strong recognition that, that representative electoral democracy is much more limited uh, than, uh, than previously thought. Parties, for instance, uh, in many countries, appoint uh, candidates, so choice is more limited and so on. And alongside this, um, he points out that, um, that there is now in national and even more so internationally, a larger array of interests operating uh, in governance, including NGOs, uh, multinational enterprises and, and so on. He then goes, uh, taking this into account, he suggests that outside of the electoral system, um, we can look at a, a model for, uh, uh, for discerning um, or accepting non-electoral claims. And this involves a couple of ideas. It invo involves the idea of surrogacy, the idea of a particular organisation representing the interests, the wider interests of a marginalised group. So this seems to fit well with the relationship with uh, future generations. And then further, he goes on to elaborate um, some criteria for working out which claims to non-electoral representation should be accepted and suggests here that, uh, that one possibility where consent is not possible, future unborn persons can't consent to who's claiming to represent them, them now, but what is possible is the notion of authenticity. And here he proposes that if, um, th that if a particular organisation purports to represent uh, another, uh, a particularly marginalised group, then um, absent evidence to the contrary, then one can accept the legitimacy uh, uh, of that claim. Now, um, I don't have time to go into this, but I, I should mention that a further very important principle that's seen as underpinning the uh, proxy notion of representation of unborn person, persons is the all-affected principle. And as, as Jörg ind uh, indicated in his comments, there seems no problem um, in accept if you accept the idea that at the heart of democracy, persons who are affected by a decision should have some say in a particular decision. There seems no reason in principle why that shouldn't be extended to unborn persons. With the proviso here that, that one uh, redefines the, 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 the underlying um, essence of this idea to extend to interests rather than the idea of having a voice, which of course can only ever be uh, an, an, an analogy. Um, a, another part of fair representation involves the idea of um, fair procedures. Now, there's 
uh, as um, many of you uh, would be aware, there's a, a lively discussion amongst philosophers about substantive as opposed to uh, procedural fairness. Uh, suffice it just to say uh, quickly today that it seems to me to make sense that uh, procedures that are fair uh, are, worth are worth supporting because they will have a higher likelihood of substantively fair outcomes. Um, one tricky issue that arises in, in, in taking that approach is, is how do you deal with proxies? Do, if a proxy is representing the interests of future generations, is it important that there's some procedural fairness that that proxy is accorded, or is that immaterial? The main issue being the, the likelihood of substantively fair outcomes flowing from the uh, involvement of the proxy in the political uh, process. So, so much for representation. Uh, moving on uh, quickly to accountability and transparency. Um, the, um, on the face of it, there would seem to be real problems in taking a national model of accountability and applying that at the international uh, uh, level, particularly given that, that uh, a, a, a large number of states around the world are not democratic. Grant and Kehoe have suggested a model which uh, usefully addresses this issue. And that is um, making a distinction between accountability through participation as opposed to accountability through delegation. So the basic idea here is that one might have low accountability in terms of the uh, possibilities for, for individual citizens in various countries to implement a global governance structure or treaty making process and so on. But there still may be possibilities for accountability through delegation where states have um, uh, set up an organisation and mandated that organisation. And then those states can hold to account a particular organisation in terms of meeting the requirements of its mandate. This approach, I think, has some potential in applying to a proposed UN Commissioner for Future Generations and other bodies. A weakness in this, in this analysis, though, I think, is that um, one's putting quite a good deal of faith in the strength of the mandate of the particular uh, body. And given to date the reluctance of states to take on strong obligations, international legal obligations, towards future generations, that does seem uh, a weakness. At the same time, uh, you will have noticed that uh, quite a few of the proposals for a, a UN Commissioner for Future Generations also in, involve the possibility of civil society playing an active role in ensuring accountability in terms of the performance of functions of that type of, of, of body. So my third um, criteria uh, is fair and effective outcomes. Now, um, as Simon mentioned earlier, uh, it's absolutely crucial that, um, that institutional reforms result in effective outcomes. Without effective outcomes, there you will not meet the requ substantive requirements of, uh, of justice. Moreover, there's a close interlinkage between substantive uh, 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 justice and fairness um, in, in that um, in negotiating a climate treaty, for instance, that's unlikely, uh, uh, you're unlikely to get agreement unless there's at least some overlapping agreement in terms of conceptions of, uh, of justice. Effectiveness can be uh, a slightly slippery uh, criteria in that it can be used if it's separated from the other criteria as, as uh, a way of promoting technocratic rule, if you like. Um, at the same time, organize international organisations and treaty bodies that, are not, that fail in terms of effectiveness 
lose credibility and lose the legitimacy. And certainly if, if there is not a reasonably strong outcome of the current global climate negotiations, the UNFCCC process would certainly begin to lose um, uh, its, its credibility. I'm just going to wind the words up now. Um, the final criteria uh, is the criteria of deliberation. Um, I, d um, I won't go into this because there's not time, but um, this, this takes on board the uh, many uh, contemporary theories uh, of uh, democracy involve deliberative democracy. And there's, under these theories, there's an interesting possibility of representing future generations through representation of discourses which certainly is an interesting way in terms of overcoming the problem of incorporating the interests of persons uh, not yet born into the political process. Um, query, however, whether um, it ultimately makes sense to do this if there's not some overarching constraint of substantive, uh, substantive uh, justice. So in conclusion, um, the, uh, I would argue it is uh, coherent and possible to expand the notion of the demos into the future and also to apply uh, this notion uh, in, in an international uh, uh, context. It's important, I think, to, uh, to be careful in terms of how the notion of representation um, is used I think it is coherent to use a, ba a notion of representation based on interest, plus this, this notion of, uh, uh, of non-electoral claims as a basis for establishing workable uh, legitimacy criteria. Um, it's part of my overall point I'd like to make is that it's very important to make more transparent the normative underpinnings made uh, 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 in terms of institutional proposals and debate these particular uh, underpinnings. Thank you. Hello. Yes, hi. Thanks very much. Um, thanks for that, Peter. So, could we ask uh, all the speakers to come here in the front so, and then we could have a, a Q&A and open the floor to a broader discussion. So, um, so shall we take uh, uh, some questions, uh, maybe uh, two at a time? So, so, we, there, so here's the first one and then at the back there, there's the second one. So. I'm uh, Nicholas Maxwell from University College London and I think I was absolutely fascinated with everything that you said, and I think it's very important. But there was one institution that seems to me to be absolutely crucial that didn't seem to get a mention, and that's the university. If we're going to solve the grave global problems that confront us, we need to learn how to do it. And for that, we need our institutions of learning to be rationally open and designed situation is that at present they're not. In the past we've inherited this idea that the basic aim of universities is to, to acquire knowledge. First of all, knowledge has to be acquired and then applying to help sol solve global problems. But actually this is profoundly and damaging and irrational. We can think seriously of the idea that the basic aim is to help us to create a better wor world. Um, the problems that we need to be concerned with and academia needs to be concerned with are problems basic intellectual path that ought to be to articulate and improve the explanation of our problems of living and propose and criticize possible solutions, actions, policies, political programs, the sorts of things that all four of you have been doing, but that isn't what goes on at present in universities. Um, I might add that this is something I've been arguing for for about 40 years now. I published a book in 1984 called From Knowledge to Wisdom, which was widely um, so, to convert this ramble into a question, um, do you agree? Uh, is it the case that if, uh, if we're really concerned about the long-term future, we need to be 
encourage and really to bring about a revolution in academia so that the basic central concern with positive delivery, problems of knowledge and technological know-how is also the critical but not the fundamental thing. Thank you. Um, do, shall you uh, just, um, I guess this was directed to pretty much uh, all of you, so uh, whoever wants to answer, go ahead. I'm not collecting questions. Uh, oh, le sorry, let's take the other one uh, as well, by the way. So um, that's right, so here at the back, so. Uh, sorry, could you wait just to get the microphone there and, uh, and if you can uh, present yourself. Uh, I'm not a big fan of microphones, but I'll give it a try anyway. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Anders uh, Müller, and I'm an MPhil in Development Studies uh, student right now at uh, Queen Elizabeth House. So anyway, thank you very much for the speeches. It was really, really informational, particu uh, particularly for someone who's an absolute novice in this uh, f um, field. But um, something that uh, I was wondering through at each presentation, in fact, and I'm really sorry if this is like a boring philosophy side of me coming out, is uh, what's the theoretical framework and how are you in fact defining uh, sustainability, true sustainability and intergenerational equity because um, the theoretical framework that you're applying is gonna completely change the burden that, uh, that is put on these different um, viewpoints that you've come out with. I did notice that the first sp uh, speaker, Professor Kenny, uh, did uh, very briefly mention something uh, Rawlsian, if I'm not much mistaken. Um, and if that is, uh, in, in fact, his and the other's uh, definitional um, framework, then how do you think that influences um, your work and uh, the burden that it actually puts on it? Because, it, I mean, if, uh, the Rawlsian notion actually, um, it's, <laughs> it's very, very difficult um, to um, live up to if we're adding a temporal uh, dimension to it. Thank you. Thanks very much for that. So I guess um, both questions were pretty much open to answer for any of you, um, whichever order you like to start, the, the young or the old. <laughs> <laughs> young or middle. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I have to start um, really very, very briefly to both because I think we all have, uh, there will be a lot of overlap between the different things that we'll say, so I'll be very quick. But uh, about uh, education and the importance of education uh, in all of that, I think that uh, uh, part of uh, the end of my talk on um, whether we can think young people can act as proxies for future generations. I mean, we, we don't have to ask the question that way. We can also think about how to reinforce the alignment of interest between current young people and future generation. And of course, the instrumental education is going to be ex extremely instrumental in that. And I just wanted to um, mention, so I've mentioned intergenerational cooperation and intergenerational practices, but one interesting example is um, the uh, WISE, the, the NGO um, concerned with the preservation of biodiversity. And they have this interesting uh, intergenerational um, cooperation going on in their firm and it's about the environment. And what's interesting is that they see um, having intergenerational diversity in, in, their, in their association as being extremely important and I think that uh, both young people who have just come out of university or, and those who have been there for longer both see themselves as in the process of learning because there are always new things that we are learning and so it's very important to see this process of completely tied with education. Um, on the theoretical framework, just very quickly, um, I can talk a, a tiny bit about just age group justice. So when we say generation or equality between generation, uh, sometimes there is a sort of a distinction, a conceptual distinction that's hidden behind the concept. So you might have um, age groups and birth cohorts. So birth cohorts are groups of people born at a specific time, and you can have, um, and you can ask questions of sustainability or equality between people, um, one after the other as they age. And you also have synchronic questions of inequalities between age groups at a given time in a society, such as the elderly and young people. And I think that. Uh, the time you spend uh, on these distinctions and also the extent to which your conception of age and vulnerability is intertwined and intersected with other issues of social justice, like class, race, gender, um, are gonna give you uh, quite a substantial difference here. Th thank you very much for both questions. I, I just had a brief comment about the, the second question. Um, uh, I think it's absolutely crucial how you define sustainable development in this field. And I, I think one thing that makes me 
a little uneasy is that um, it, it may be that um, from a political feasibility point of view that the, the, the most manageable mandate for a new institution, for instance, um, the UN Commissioner for Future Generations, would be based on um, a Brundtland's uh, definition of sustainable uh, development. Um, but a problem with that, of course, is that, is that that can be interpreted as, uh, as, um, as putting the emphasis on economic development and, and not putting pressure on, on the more radical sort of shifts that are required to address some of the problems we're talking about. So I think there is a real tension between um, political feasibility and, and what I think flows from an obligation, an ethical obligation towards future generations in terms of there being at least a requirement of a version of sustainability where irreplaceable elements of the ecosystem and particularly the climate is not trashed. <laughs> um, but you'll see different views on that. Steve van der Heiden in his book Atmospheric Justice, he, he seeks to base intergenerational obligations on sustainable development, which I, I don't think works. I think it's a circular argument. I think it's more plausible to argue for sustainable development as a convincing vehicle for implementing obligations towards future generations that have, that, that are rest more firmly on core human rights that Simon has argued for and, and um, other approaches. But anyway, I still don't. So, um, yeah, on the first question, I, I entirely agree. I mean, I think we didn't have much time, but I think um, there's often a focus on political institutions and legal institutions, and that's what I was speaking to. But I think we should also look at other actors who often release from some of the, uh, the pressures or can be released from some of the pressures that affect politicians. So it seems to me universities are our ideal places for... Um, for thinking about ideas, some of which may turn out to be, uh, you know, implausible or not work out, um, but they have the space and time to think of innovative solutions, uh, rethink some of the assumptions we have, um, and can call other institutions to account. And in a way, uh, that it's actually what the, the Martin School is trying to do, because uh, it's for the 21st century and beyond. So, I think Margaret Mead said there should be chairs for the future. <laughs> she had this idea that you should set up institutions whose role it was just to think about the, the future with scientists and historians and philosophers, and it seems to me that would be very valuable. The second question, I mean, the way I'm thinking about what you're posing is how do you deal with reasonable disagreement about ideas of what we owe future generations? And, um, and so some people might say, well, we should just we should leave them as good a world as we could, or as equal as us, or... Um, and no worse than some threshold. My two thoughts on this are, you should try and find some overlapping consensus, some, something which all visions of intergenerational justice will agree on. Uh, and so you could think of some, some common core interests that just should not be jeopardized and work with that. Uh, when I said Rawlsian, I didn't mean Rawls's views on intergenerational justice, just what he calls in political liberalism, uh, an ideal of public justification. The second comment I just want to make on the handling of reasonable disagreement is actually one reason why I prefer focusing on legislatures and, and doing it via that than courts. Um, so I'm kind of sympathetic to what some of the things Yoke was saying, for example, on difficult decisions when there's complex value judgments. Uh, it seems to me it's just better to do that through a legislative process than through courts. And that is another way of responding to the reasonable disagreement. And the final thing I'll say on it is although my talk was about intergenerational justice, there are lots of reasons for caring about the long term that aren't really dependent on views of intergenerational justice. So if you look at all the spending um, post Hurricane Katrina, uh, the, the political science analyses say people ended up spending 15 times more than they would have had to spend if they'd taken preemptive action. And that's not on highfalutin obligations to people who haven't yet been born, it's just it made a lot of sense to invest now uh, rather than let it happen and then um, it just incredibly inefficient and costly. So it's not always about intergenerational justice. Thank you. Yeah, I completely agree with the first speaker that uh, sciences should move out of their ivory tower. But don't forget we're on the first panel, 
we have a second panel <laughs> with three practical reality examples and we have people from NGOs here like the Intergenerational Foundation in London, so maybe you'll be more satisfied after the second. Uh, <laughs> okay. The, the second question regarding theoretical framework. Well, my theoretical framework is justice as impartiality. So I would say um, no one must be discriminated against for reasons um, which are contingent like sex or ethnicity or things like this. And one of these uh, um, variables is the time of your birth. So <coughs> if people are discriminated against just because they are born 50 years from now, this would be unfair from a point of view of justice as impartiality. And I think Rawls also shares this notion. Mm, but on the other hand, it's quite difficult to assess the quality of life for different people. One important question I always ask my student is, if you could choose your year of birth, or if, you, if you would be able to choose your preferred year of birth, not your sex, not your class, uh, whatever status, but would you like to be born, say, in 1946, in 1850, in, I don't know, whatever year in the past or the future? Most people wouldn't go back very far. So our time, present time, doesn't seem to be the worst of all times. I agree what, uh, with what Ian Golding said in the beginning, that the 21st century could be the best of all centuries and could be the worst. We're, we're walking a very thin line. But um, maybe then the, 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 the biggest and foremost duty of, of all is to prevent uh, ecological and, and social collapse, maybe a third world war. That's what we have to do with respect to future generations. So should we take two more questions? Uh, could you keep your questions short and then, uh, and also your answers short? So there was a fr <laughs> um, just here there was before, and then at the back there, second one. So and but then we'll have a tea and coffee in five minutes or so, so you have the possibility then to carry on talking with the presenters. Thank you very much, um, James Luger from Ofgem, the um, GB regulator for energy. Two questions, hopefully both quite short. One is, um, sorry, can you keep it to a one question? Because we're um, could I ask two, but very quick ones? <laughs> two folded questions. Thank you. One is a very quick observation you may not have a view on, which is the potential role of trustee beneficiary as a legal basis for some of these kind of roles. And that's perhaps to Peter. And the second question more uh, provocatively is really about, could we not just simply mortgage future generations if the, the essence of the crisis we're in is about getting through this narrowing channel the ecological collapse, can we not simply offload the cost of that onto future generations and any observations on the moral or ethical or even feasibility of doing that? <coughs> Calypso Nicolaitis, professor here at Oxford. Hi, Simon. Um, yeah, I, I listened to you all with great interest, having myself had the experience of leaving the ivory tower to be in a wise man group, yes, they called us wise man, mm -hmm. in Brussels to think about Europe 2030. And there, one of the principles I tried to push was sustainable integration. And as a small remark here um, to the last panelist is that I think we need to leverage terms that speak to the new generation in our discursive uh, uh, grounding. And sustainability is critical uh, applied to, so I think we need to generalize sustainability, but that's a bigger debate and, and to use it for the purposes that you're speaking about. And I would also say to the point about demos that we don't need, a, the whole of political theory is, is very much about responsibilities to strangers and all the gradation between us and them. I'm not sure why we need a single demos or to think in terms of a single demos to think about solidarity in space and time. And um, Simon can, and you can all speak a lot to that. But in any case, these are broad framing. My, one of the many questions that arise when I think of the way you know, young people or students and kids relate to this is, to me, there's a fundamental distinction between existential threats that face future generation and simply the fact that they might be less well off, this kind of thing, qualitative versus quantitative change. And you would think existent, and, and so my question is, do, should we think differently about these? Uh, including in selfish terms, because if, if humanity was to kind of more or less disappear, then we, the word posterity, which is about memory and remembrance, 
would not mean anything anymore and we wouldn't exist anymore not being remembered in the future. So there might be also a selfish reason why existential threats matter. But of course, more fundamentally, it means a right to be born, a right to exist for future generation. And isn't that fundamentally different? And then doesn't it come back to the fact of kind of demonstrating existential threats? Thank you. Thank you. Um, feel free to answer in which particular order you like. Um, Juliana, do you want to start? Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe I'm mistaken, but for my perspective. Make sure to take the microphone close to oh you. Yes, sure. Uh, maybe just on the second question uh, on existential threats, and um, that's a very interesting uh, suggestion, and I think I'm going to think about it a bit more because. Um, so I wonder whether this sort of spiral, this very worrying existential threat that may happen in the future is higher on those who think they may experience it potentially or not. Uh, in the, so I think it would be interesting to have a look at, um, you know, comparatively how, how young people describe these fears and how they relate to these fears and how other people who precisely relate to these fears. And I think we could learn a lot from that. Um, but I think that there are some existential threats as well. Of course, it's not about, um, whether humanity will leave or will not leave. But uh, for example, if you are a young person at the moment and you look at rates of youth unemployment, I mean, there are things that touch to the very existence uh, or your very future and your uh, occupational security is not ensured. I mean, so they are very, very strong uh, threats that are being faced by young people now. And I think it would be interesting to see how they relate to these di different kinds of threats. Just very, uh, just very briefly, the the uh, the, the question about uh, offloading costs onto uh, future uh, generations. Um, there seems, um, I mean, one one problem with that from a normative point of view is it seems to breach a polluter pays idea. Um, but uh, of course, you can it still might be justified on the basis of it being effective. But in terms of political feasibility, I really wonder if it's likely to ever get up um, because um, it seems some of the most conservative governments that are most reluctant to take action on climate change also have strong views about keeping debt very low, in which case it would seem unlikely to, to get traction. But I don't, know, I don't know a lot about this proposal. I might be able to have more to say um, on that. The, the trusteeship idea it is one that has been raised in uh, the international level that the idea of uh, quite some time ago the idea of revamping the um, decolonization um, UN committee and converting that into some type of trustee body that's never got anywhere and part of the practical reason for that is the um, the difficulty of th that would require an amendment to the UN Charter which is extremely difficult um, to do. Um, of course, a trustee idea in terms of a moral, uh, as an ethical basis or framework for future generations is, is, is one that um, uh, does have a great deal of uh, attraction. And finally, the, 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 the question about um, the demos and obligation to strangers, that's something I'll have to consider further. I mean, the, the all affected uh, principle, if applied in an expansive way, of course, does provide uh, a basis for obligation uh, that extend to strangers. Um, but uh, anyway, that's Thanks. So, um, <coughs> yeah, two comments. What I just speak to the one on um, could we not just mortgage the future generation? I mean, there are actually a lot of kind of complications here on this. So some people do propose this by John Broom, um, a colleague in philosophy, as a way of having broken through the log jam and dispute of the climate change. He says, well, I can't just act now and just harp on some of the costs, which he thinks is unfair, but it would help get a breakthrough. Of course, there's going to be practical problems about just how much you can harp on in terms of costs. Um, the big question, you know, I think we need to ask there is, would that be unfair? Because on certain models, it isn't unfair. If you think future generations are going to be wealthier, then what, um, as William Nordhaus at Yale puts it, you know, why should poor generations subsidize the rich? It's, 
but you know that depends on a lot of kind of assumptions that there is going to be economic growth. Um, so uh, it takes more time than I've got allocated, but I do think it really touches on kind of some important practical question and normative ones. And, and one of the normative ones is, aren't we already passing on a lot of the costs already? So you know, if you're a young person and you're paying for your education now and you can't buy a house and uh, there's few jobs around, then you know, the, the context might not be propitious for passing on yet more costs. Uh, so yeah, I should really speak to you <laughs> about the role uh, that you did and um, and because that's the kind of forum where Generational performance indicators could be quite relevant about scrutinising roles. Take your I mean, microphone. Uh, uh, sorry, on. <laughs> I mean, I, I think what you were saying was there's a distinction between existential threats, and I think that's right. Uh, and I, in a way, that's how I would wanted to respond to the first per the person to uh, your right to say, look, there can be lots of different normative frameworks. We can all disagree, but here are some absolutely catastrophic threats, and we need to deal with those. But what I would want to add is we just we shouldn't stop there because imagine we can you know avert those catastrophes, but the future generations are like worse off than us. They can turn around to the baby boomer generation and say, but uh, you you had all these opportunities and you squandered it and you you left it worse off for us than you got yourself. Uh, and for what reason, right? We're just born later in time and, and we get this you know rum hand. I think they'd have reasonable cause for complaint. So I think we should focus on the existential threats. I mean, that, but, and they're, they're much more likely to garner agreement. But I still think it's wrong even you know, to citizens of affluent countries who will not have to suffer those existential threats, that they're facing worse opportunities and for no reasons other than they're born later in time. That, that seems to me unfair. Yeah, just, just a very short comment on the all affected uh, principle. I think there are many different versions of this principle and uh, very often um, Robert Goodin's um, eminent article in, in philosophy and public affairs is, is, uh, is discussed in this context. Uh, but um, I think we, we can completely omit the question whether people in other states who are also affected by a, an election, for instance, going on here in Britain, should have an say, a say in this election. Uh, um, what, what, what our context is, if, um, if we should let people participate um, who will become citizens of this country in the future. So the all affected principle is, 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 is relevant in different contexts. We don't have to, um, to, to buy it on all, in all contexts, um, but we don't have to uh, say we can discard it because it does not hold in, in all contexts. Thank you very much. So um, that's it for panel one. So we've heard uh, several very interesting presentations on the normative and theoretical background framework for uh, long-term governance. And uh, next, on the second panel, we look more, uh, there's three presentations looking more at the practice of of long-term governance, but and there's tea and coffee at the back now. But uh, uh, can you uh, can I ask you to join once more and uh, and give a warm thank you to all the presenters here. Thank you.